So I am sitting here with Paul Davidson and I am Gavi James, formerly known as Gavi Davidson. I'm sitting in Los Angeles and tell us, tell the audience where you're sitting. I'm in uh, Morton Grove, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Fabulous. And how's the weather over there today? Cold. Cold. Yeah. Bummer. Yeah. All right. Well, my first question for you is, will you tell me a little bit about where you grew up? I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, what was your neighborhood like? Well, I lived in, the, uh, if you know Brooklyn, Bensonhurst and Borough Park. It was a, a middle, middle and lower middle income families, uh, apartment houses, a few people owned their own houses, but most people lived in apartments. And where did you live? I lived for the most part in an apartment. Was it one bedroom, two bedrooms? Well, uh, originally I lived in a uh, two bedroom apartment uh, on the fourth floor of a walk up. Oh, so lots of stairs. Yeah, no elevator yeah. in, the, in the apartment building. It was Can six you, stories high. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the neighborhood and what it was like? Well, it was a uh, uh, middle, low middle income neighborhood. Uh, there was, as I say, uh, uh, there was all of basically apartment houses. There were a few people who owned their own houses in mm -hmm. the area. Uh, and uh, it was. It was mainly the, uh, initially where I lived was mainly a Jewish neighborhood. There were non-Jews as well, but most of the people there were, were Jewish. That's nice. And did you walk to school every day? I walked to school, uh, public school I walked to was public school 160, and it was about eight blocks a walk from where I lived. Uh, and were you allowed to walk by yourself or did you have to yeah, have your parents? I, I walked by myself, basically. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your parents? My father uh, owned his own business. Uh, basically, he, he was, my father was born in, in, in uh, well, uh, where they're having all the fighting now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in called Russia at the yeah, uh, and he lived uh, uh, outside of a city called Kiev, uh, which is where. And when I asked him, I was going to visit Russia, and I asked him where Kiev was. He says, "Well, it was one day's horseback ride from Kiev." <laughs> so I, I don't even I, know I, what uh, that means. <laughs> I figured it meant you less than 50 miles. You couldn't ride yeah. 50 miles one day. So I looked at a map. Uh, I knew the name of the, the village that he was brought up in. Uh, I could not find it on the map. But when I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., I found that there was a list of cities that the Nazis had wiped out during the, their occupation of Europe and so on. And one of the cities, that villages, I should say, not a city, that they wiped out was my father's uh, village. So it had been wiped out in the Second World War. Uh, my father's father, my father came over uh, when he was a little child. We were, and since he wasn't, he was born in Russia, he did not have a birth certificate. Oh. So when he applied for Social Security, he had to prove he was 65. So uh, and that's not easy. But uh, I went on and I found the uh, boat that he came on. And wow. uh, he was listed, obviously, on the passenger list. And he was listed as four years old coming over. I think he was older than four years old, but. Uh, his father probably listened to us for to get a cheaper child. Uh, <laughs> a right. cheaper ticket? Yeah. So do you know why your grandfather came over to America? Was there a specific reason that made him leave? Sure. The streets were paved with gold, he thought. <laughs> Did he uh, find gold? Not really. He, no. he came over... Uh, 
and uh, uh, he came with his wife, uh, who was my grandmother, but uh, she never spoke English. She spoke Russian or, or Yiddish. And so, although I visited their, their house very often, my, my grandfather's house, I never was able to speak to my grandmother because we, we could not converse. Mm-hmm. My grandfather was a carpenter and he started the business which my father took over. It was called uh, Charlson Picture Company. My father's name was Charles, and uh, and and that was the business my father worked in all, all his life. Uh, Did he ever ask you to to work with him? Well, I when I was a teenager and so on, I used to work in the summers in his office, taking care of his office. And, uh, answering the phone for him and taking care of his records and for, you know, things like that. But uh, basically the uh, only people who worked for him were carpenters and he made uh, store fixtures uh, and a number of store fixtures. In fact, there was one store fixture he even made on uh, Times Square. Wow. Yeah. That's Uh, cool. uh, Yeah. It was Wally Frank's tobacco store. I don't know if it still exists there, but it not. I don't know. We'll have to Google it. It was so, about uh, 44th Street or 45th Street in uh, right off Broadway type. Of thing. Wow. It's probably some really good prime real estate nowadays. Right. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your mom. My mother was born here in the United States and uh, she grew up, she became a bookkeeper. And since we were not very wealthy, uh, my mother, when, when by the time I was about six or seven years old, my mother went back to work. And she worked most of her life. Uh, she worked as a bookkeeper or a secretary or something like that. Uh, but she was an American, born in the United States type of thing. Where uh, in the United States was she born? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Actually, Good place. Uh, Coney Island. I don't know if you know Coney Island. Yeah. Yeah, where they have that fun theme park, right? Right. Uh, my grand, my mother's mother still owned, a, when I was a little kid, still owned a house in Coney Island uh, on 33rd Street, if anybody's interested. <laughs> cool. Did you go visit uh, her a lot? We visited her a lot during the summer. We even stayed there for weeks because we could go to the beach. It was a couple of, you know, two, three blocks from the beach. So we often stayed at my grandmother's house. My grandfather was dead, so I never knew who, Mm -hmm. I never knew him, basically. But he apparently worked for the BMT, which is the the subway system in in, in, uh, Brooklyn. Yeah, that's cool. So you had one sister, is that correct? I had a sister, four years older than me, yes. And tell me a little bit about her. Well, uh, what should I say about it? I don't, uh, she was an uh, ordinary person. Uh, uh, my family was poor, so they didn't send her to college, and she never applied to Brooklyn College or places like that. So she went to high school and then went out to work, got married, she had a child as well. Uh, uh, I was uh, the second child, four years younger. Uh, My folks couldn't afford to to send me to college, but I went to Brooklyn College. I I applied to Brooklyn College and uh, got in, so I had free education for my four years at Brooklyn College, and I majored in uh, Biology and chemistry at Brooklyn College. And did you like school? I enjoyed it very much. I was a very enthusiastic student. And when I finished, this is really an interesting story. I finished Brooklyn College I, uh, as a, with a biochem major. I went on to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School going for a PhD in biochemistry actually became an assistant instructor in biochemistry at the medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. Before I could 
finished uh, my PhD in biochemistry, I was drafted into the army. This mm. was during the uh, Korean War. And the army classified me correctly as a uh, medic. And so I was assigned to uh, Camp Kilmer in the medical school, a uh, medical uh, uh, hospital at Camp Kilmer. Now, uh, I this uh, involves Senator Joseph McCarthy, this next story I'm going to tell you. I don't okay. know. Do you know who Joe McCarthy was? I, I think so. You cut out a little bit, but tell me the story, and and I hopefully I'll hear the whole thing. Joe McCarthy was a big anti-communist right-wing senator, I think from Michigan, but I'm not sure. In any case, uh, I was a biochemist, uh, and I uh, before I could finish my PhD, I was drafted into the army, and the Army made me a medic and assigned me to Camp Kilmer, which is in New Jersey, near New Brunswick, uh, as uh, in the hospital as a medic. So I was in charge of the lab. And since I knew a lot of biochemistry, I was in charge of the lab, Camp Kilmer. One night I was on night duty in the lab, and all of a sudden the ambulance comes in, and they brought in General Zwicker. Now, General Zwicker was the head of Camp Kilmer. And he came, they brought him in and they, they brought him into the lab because they wanted me to do some medical uh, tests on him. And the doctor, who was a captain, came in and said, uh, this is General Zwicker. I want you to test for such and such a disease, which was a, a, a South Pacific disease, which he had picked up during the Second World War. And tell me if he's has that he's feeling sick and I'm not sure how serious it is. So I didn't since this was a rare South Pacific disease, I had to look it up in the catalog and, and there was a test for it and I did the test and I couldn't tell. So the finally the captain came in and said, Well is he sick or isn't he sick? And I said, Well I don't know, Captain, but uh he may be, but I don't know why don't we just keep him in the hospital for a few days and see how he develops? And the doctor said, no, he, I must know by eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And I said, well, why? He said, well, because Senator Joe McCarthy has subpoenaed him to appear in front of his congressional anti-communist committee in the Senate tomorrow morning. And he's either got to appear or not appear. And if he's not sick, he's got to appear. If he is sick, I can get a, a postponement for him. So I said, well, I don't know. He says, well, you got to tell me. I said, well, you look at this. this here's the slides and so on that I've made. You look. He says, no, no. It's your decision. You have to make it. And I says, why? I said, well, he told me that McCarthy had found out that there were communists uh, at the Camp Kilmer, soldiers who were card-carrying communists, uh, members of the Communist Party of Brooklyn and, and elsewhere. Uh, in fact, there was one famous one called, uh, let's see, Irving Perez, uh, who was a Brooklyn dentist. Okay, and... Uh, announced to everybody that he was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. And of course, Rick, uh, uh, of course uh, McCarthy was anti-communist and was searching for all of these things. And, he, and the doctor said, so he's got to either appear or not appear. And we've got to tell him why. If he, do, if he doesn't appear, it's because he's sick with this disease. So I said, uh, well, I don't think he's sick. So he says, all right, you sign this form, which is a form that, that he was going to submit to the McCarthy, say that uh, he isn't sick and he can appear and so on. Well, anyhow, uh, to make the story a little shorter, uh, General Zwicker appeared in front of the McCarthy committee and McCarthy said he understands that a whole bunch of communists at Camp Kilmer, why are you supporting all this communist activity in an American army base type of thing. 
And Fricka said, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, somebody has told, somebody in your staff has told me that the half of the, not half, but a whole bunch of uh, people are communists, particularly at the uh, um, medical center there. And, uh, and uh, McCarthy browbeat this Ricker, this, what is he uh, encouraging all these communists in American army camp and so on and so forth. And finally, the uh, attorney for the, uh, for the government, who was obviously supporting Ms. Ricker, was there to help Ms. Ricker along, uh, said to uh, McCarthy, sir, have you no shame? How can you be picking on this famous American war hero, Second World War? And uh, uh, TV picked up, sir, have you no shame? And uh, Edward R. Murrow and a number of other people uh, picked it up and the media picked it up and played it up. And that's, sir, you have you no shame, led to McCarthy being cast out, you know, he was picking on an American hero. And so he was ultimately rejected from the, uh, from the Senate because of this uh, attack on General Zwicker. And so I sort of feel that I was responsible for yeah. getting McCarthy out of the Senate because I decided that the General Zwicker could go to testify if I had said that he was sick. He wouldn't have testified and that uh, wouldn't have happened. So right. uh, that's. Uh, I wonder what would have happened if if uh, right. if you had said he was sick. <laughs> that's right. That's a good question. What would, would he have gone on and become even a stronger anti communist person in the, in the United States in those days, which were very strong, you know? Yeah. Anyhow, so that's, I affected American history. Definitely. It's a really good story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so tell me a little bit about your wife, Louise. Well, uh, let's see. I met uh, during the, when I was a teenager, during the summer, I had to do work. So I started to work. Uh, uh, there were a whole bunch of Jewish hotels and in the Catskill Mountains near, uh, but there was one Jewish hotel in West Orange, New Jersey, which was very close to New York City, where uh, a lot of Jewish families went and uh, the husband could com commute from the uh, West Orange to work in Manhattan or wherever he worked. And uh, so I worked there as a busboy and this, uh, my wife, or the woman who I met as my wife, worked at Camp Kilmer, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, at the, the hotel uh, as a, uh, uh, in, in the uh, to take care of the kids, children in the camps there. Mm -hmm. And that's how we met and, uh, and, and fell in love, basically. Was it love at first sight when you saw her across the room? I think it was pretty much at least on my side was. Yeah. Do you she remember? Was from, she was Sorry. from Brooklyn also. And at, at the time I was going to Brooklyn College uh, and she was going to Brooklyn College. So we also were able to meet after after this summer at, at the Goldman Hotel in West, West uh, Orange, New Jersey. And uh, that's... Uh, and we got married ultimately. Do you remember uh, your wedding and what that was like? Well, it was interesting because uh, in those days, if you were Jewish, the uh, f the family of the wife threw the wedding. But my wife's uh, family were, was very poor. They were living in a city housing project. They couldn't even afford regular housing. So they couldn't afford to throw a wedding. And I was, uh, and, and my parents were a little annoyed about that. So I, I had earned a lot of money in this, over the summer, over the last couple of summers. And so I decided that I would throw the wedding because uh, we could have a nice wedding and people would come. And they'd give us uh, nice gifts. And in those days, gifts were usually in cash checks and things like that. So I threw the wedding. 
Uh, okay. Do you remember uh, it being fun? I thought it was fun, yeah. In fact, uh, I had some pictures of it, uh, and we enjoyed the wedding. And, uh, and then from the right after the wedding, we went on our honeymoon to Lake Placid, because we got married in December. Uh, and neither of us had skied or ever been in the, you know, I, I had done a lot of uh, ice skating in the, as a teenager. There was a place called Brooklyn Ice Palace where you go, could skate, ski uh, in Brooklyn during the winter, during the winter and even most of the summer since it was indoor. Uh, and we went to Lake Placid and, and we went skiing and so on. That's, uh, that's what we did, did for our honeymoon. Sounds like a nice honeymoon. It was very pleasant and very different because yeah. <laughs> Jews and in then, those days didn't ski. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me um, about what it was like when you had your first child, Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was it like? I'm trying to think where. Where you were. What? Yeah. Where I was at the time, by the time I had my first child. Uh, yeah, I think so. By, by that time, I had uh, uh, I had been a, a, a biochemist, but when I got drafted into the army and went to Camp Kilmer, got involved with this McCarthy thing. Uh, I got onto, the army put me onto a project which I felt very disastrous because it had to do with biological weapons and so on. So I decided I didn't want to be a biochemist. And so I started going to school. Since I was a camp come, I could still go to Brooklyn College and things like that and City College. And uh, I started going to school and I became an economist. And I actually went to the, uh, for my peer, uh, the taxpayer in this. I went free all the way to my PhD because wow. taxpayers at Brooklyn College and at City College where I got my master's degree paid for my tuition. And then I went to the University of Pennsylvania and under the GI Bill got that free as well. And... Uh, so when Robert was born, I was we were living in, in in the suburb of Philadelphia, as I was going for my PhD at the time. And then, uh, remind I don't actually know how close everybody is in age, but then you had Diane and my father Greg. Right. So uh, how was how was it having three kids, and were you also still in school? Uh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> uh, I don't think so no by the time I, uh after i had robert for a year or so i had gotten my phd and i was teaching at rutgers university in new brunswick new jersey when diane was born so it was about three they were about three years apart okay mm -hmm. and I, I was teaching at rutgers and i was earning a big salary of six thousand one hundred and eighty dollars Teaching wow. at Rutgers University, which is pretty low, and uh, one of the one day while uh, we were, uh, my wife was reading New York Times and saw an ad. Uh, at that point in time, I was an economist. I had gone for my PhD in economics at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and my wife saw an ad in the newspaper, in the New York Times, for an economist for fifteen thousand dollars a year. Uh, at a oil company in Houston, Texas, Continental Oil Company. And she said, why don't you apply for this job? And said, 6,000, you can make 15,000. I, I said, you apply for it. Here's my CV, you apply for it. So she applied for it. And believe it or not, they called me down to Houston, Texas. And I said, let's go. I mean, first of all, they flew us down. We'd never been on an airplane. Second, they put us up in a beautiful hotel and treated us, you know, with dinner and uh, nice things like that. And finally, they offered me the job. So I got a job for $15,000 a year from $6,000 a year. And $15,000 a year in those days was top 10% of the income distribution in the United States. 
so we lived in, uh, we went to Houston and we lived there for a year or so. But Houston was a Jim Crow city at the time. Mm -hmm. They, the blacks, they had separate restrooms for blacks and even separate uh, movie houses for blacks and things like that. And it was a very, uh, what did I say, for New York City Jews, which we were, it was very strange to live in a, uh, a city like that. And I and, uh, I carpooled with the uh, uh, other executives of the oil company and things like that. And uh, they, they were very right wing and I was very left wing. So uh, it was a very strange political situation. Uh, and so uh, I I couldn't take working for Continental Oil for very long. Although I learned a lot about the company and how the oil industry, and uh, I therefore applied to the University of Pennsylvania, where I had got my PhD, to my thesis advisor. Uh, could he get me a job? And he was able to get me a job arguing. I was one of the few economists who would be the teacher who actually worked for industry before teaching. And so I went back to the University of Pennsylvania and we moved back to the Philadelphia area, actually to a place called Drexel Hill, which is a uh, suburb. And we, uh, our kids grew up uh, for the most part in Drexel Hill type of thing. Very cool. And you spent... Uh, Sorry, you spent a little time. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, your father, by the time we, he was born, I was back teaching at Rutgers University again uh, and um, teaching uh, economics at the time. And so we lived in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a time when you guys lived in London. Is that correct? Yeah, well, there was a, a, among other places, I taught at Cambridge University. Uh, and uh, I became a student of John Maynard Keynes. I don't know if you know who Keynes was. He's a famous, I do. famous economist, etc. And so uh, I went back to, uh, and I got to know a lot of his former students because uh, I started writing articles in the, in the economic journals, and I got to know some of his former students who was still English and teaching at Cambridge and so on. And they invited me over to Cambridge. And so I, uh, Louise and I moved over and we lived in England for, uh, I went to Bristol University for one year and I went to teach at Cambridge University for another year. And we lived in in England for those couple of years that, uh, that I taught in, in the English university system. That sounds fun. And, and then I we came back to the United States. Yeah. And, uh, I also heard I, that you I continue to teach it. At, uh, Sorry, I think we're we're a little what? delayed. Keep going. And uh, and so uh, uh, I taught uh, again. Uh, I went back and taught at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in uh, the. The Wharton School, which was the business school, a very famous business school at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, my thesis advisor, Sidney Weintraub, was, had been a professor there at the Wharton School. And so he and I started a journal called the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics, which was to contribute to bringing Keynesian economics to the United States. And uh, since that time, I've been uh, noted for, uh, uh, if you look me up on Google, they'll say I'm one of the leading spokesmen for the post-Keynesian School of Economics, uh, which is interesting because there is the, in, in the United States, there is a school of Keynesian economics, which has nothing to do with Keynes, in which one, one of the things that Sidney and I were trying to do is to explain to the economists as well as to anybody else why all these talking heads in front of Congress and then uh, you see on TV who are telling Congress what to do about unemployment and so on uh, and claiming they were Keynesians and Sidney and I were trying to explain they weren't Keynesians they had the wrong message and they were leading 
us down the wrong road. That must have been frustrating. <laughs> it was very rewarding in the sense that, that there were some people who took our arguments to success, for, yeah. for example. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened to me uh, over the years, I can't remember exactly what year, but since I had worked for an oil company, uh, uh, while uh, the, the OPEC countries started raising the price of oil and the price of gasoline went up to $3 and $4, $5 a gallon, you know, which is, became very expensive. Uh, I was, uh, I wrote a couple of articles uh, in uh, uh, the Brookings Institute in Washington testifying in front of some congressional committees about what we should do about the oil industry and about OPEC and was leaving uh, interviewed by McNeil Lira. I don't know if you know who McNeil Lira was, mm -hmm. but they were, it's now called the PBS News Hour, but at that time it was McNeil Lira and try to explain to people what we should do to prevent the price of gasoline from rising. And interestingly enough, I said, we can learn from the Bible. There's a serious part of the Bible which has a great economic message. And the economic message, if I can take a couple of minutes, is, of course, we can you know, we're now seeing gasoline prices rising again. We can learn yeah. from the Bible what to do about it. And the message was as simple in the Bible as the Pharaoh had his dream. And he saw seven lean cows and then he saw seven fat cows. And he didn't know what that dream meant. So uh, somebody told him there was some Jewish prophet named Jacob who can tell him what it meant. So he called Jacob in and he said, Jacob, what does it mean? He says, well, it's very simple. Uh, the dream says in the first seven, next seven years, uh, Agricultural production in, in Egypt will be very high. There'll be too much food. The price of food will fall because there's so much food relative to demand for food. And farmers' income will fall with, the, with too much food. Then there'll be, uh, when there's no more farmers or very few farmers left, uh, we'll start losing food, food production. And the price of food will go up dramatically. And... and uh, the Pharaoh says, what should we do about it? He says, well, it's very simple. And his solution was this, as easy as this, which, by the way, uh, we've adopted a number of times. He says, in the seven lean years, of, we should, the government should buy food off the market, raise the price of food. That would raise the farmer's income, and they could continue to produce food. And you should take all that food and store it in granaries. And then in the seven lean years, when the farm production fell, you should, and the price of food went up dramatically and it became very expensive to eat, you should sell the food that you had stored in these granaries and keep the price of food down and people will live happily and farmers will have income over all 14 years and things like that. And so that, that was a very simple principle. And I told, uh, since the price of gasoline was going up at the time in McNeil Lira because of OPEC, he said, well, what do you get out of it? I said, very simple. The United States uh, has property which it leases out to uh, drillers to uh, offshore property, and they get royalties. They should take some of the royalties in terms of the drilling uh, uh, crude oil store it in the, uh, while well, I can do it, store it in the, uh, in Louisiana, salt, um, uh, I call it strategic petroleum reserves. And then when the price of gasoline was going up, I told McNeil, as it is now, the government should sell the crude oil that it has stored up in the strategic petroleum reserve, push the price down and that will ease the, the uh, pressure on, on uh, consumers for this high price of gasoline. And uh, I also testified in front of several congressional committees as well as writing an article or two about this. And uh, believe it or not, the Bush administration was uh, adopted my policy. Wow. And so they sold from the uh, 
strategic petroleum reserve, pushing the price of crude oil down, and that pushed the price of gasoline down. And, That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so uh, now. Can you uh, help us now? <laughs> uh, we could do it again now, but so far I haven't been able to get anybody in Washington interested in it. Yeah. Yeah. First, first administration was interested in it. And, uh, and so, uh, again, I was successful in getting something done. That's awesome. Did you ever get nervous before you had to speak in front of people or if you had to do like a, a lecture in school or anything? No, not at all. In fact, I must have testified during this oil thing in front of at least a dozen uh, congressional committees who were wondering about. And I never was, I guess I'm an egotist enough. <laughs> that I never was bothered by the fact that uh, there were people that, who actually were listening to me. Mm -hmm. I was very pleased that somebody was listening. Does anything make you nervous? Does anything make me nervous? Not yeah. really. Yeah. That's convenient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So tell me, um, I, I know that you traveled a lot when your kids were little. Is there, um, uh, or when they were growing up, or or maybe you left them, depending on what you did, um, was there a specific place you traveled to that you liked the most? Well, England was, a, we lived in England while I was teaching Cambridge. And uh, the three kids went to the English school system, which is, of course, quite different than the American mm -hmm. school system. And your father went to, uh, I can't remember, C. Mills Junior School for for boys, I, I think that was the school he went to. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so they got a, a English education in their early years, which is a much stronger education than, than you would get in American public schools type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume that helped them considerably being students later on in life. Uh, and then we enjoyed, we all enjoyed living in, in England at the time. Yeah, it sounds fun. How was the food? Was it tasty? The food? Well, uh, <laughs> unforgettable. <laughs> yeah, English food is a little different than American food. Yeah. yeah. I remember my dad said he really liked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Um, so I have just a couple more questions. Although yeah. before I dive into those, is there a story that you haven't told me that you would like to, to discuss? Mm. <laughs> Hard to know exactly what. what uh... There's a lot of stories in there. Is there maybe um, anything political that happened throughout your life that made a really big impact on your on your day to day life, or just a memory that you have? No, I mean, I, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, we grew up in a what would be called a politically liberal neighborhood. So I was always uh, politically liberal, left wing, if you want, if you want to say, you know, type of thing. And again, I had this thing with McCarthy, but I also had another uh, uh, thing with uh, when Nixon was president. Uh, and uh, since I was, again, writing about the oil industry a lot, since I knew about the oil, since I had worked for the company, and I wrote something, I forget exactly what the, the problem was, but it, it was a paper for Brookings Institute. And uh, I pointed out that uh, uh, the United States government has these oil properties offshore and they lease it out to, uh, to American drillers to drill offshore and so on. And when OPEC raised the price of oil, and they did that by cutting back the amount of oil they were selling to the West and so on. I found, I looked and found that the price of oil being uh, drilled and uh, off on these American properties, the US government properties that the private companies were doing, suddenly dropped off dramatically as well. And the question was why? We can see the OPEC was cutting it back to raise the price. But helped to support the price was the fact that oil from from uh, offshore uh, 
in the Atlantic and Pacific offshore United States was was fall, falling as well meant that there was a shortage of oil and therefore that kept the price high. So I, since I had worked for our company, I knew what to look for. So I went to the Department of Interior uh, and there were certain statistics that were being collected by the government had always been collected by the government. Nobody ever used them. And I looked them and I noticed that the amount of production being produced offshore had dropped dramatically when OPEC raised the price. And uh, so I wrote an article and said, well, this is crazy because after all, when you look at why the oil companies have reduced their production of crude oil on, on these offshore properties, 90% of the each oil company for each well explained why that well was producing less. And almost all of them said there was a tool dropped into the oil well and that had stopped production until they could clean out the tool and so on. And I said, something was wrong there. It can't be that you know, 90 oil wells all could stop production with a tool being dropped in within the next, within a month of each other. And I said, after all, these were uh, American government properties. So the, the leases were under the Secretary of the Interior and the Secretary of the Interior had a legal responsibility called due diligence to make sure that the wells were produced with due diligence and not mm-hmm. uh, held back. And I, again, I, I, I advertised that argument and it led to the Secretary of the Interior in the uh, Nixon administration having to resign. Wow. Because the Department of Interior hadn't exercised due diligence. So again, uh, I had an impact on the American political system. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you've had some some pretty impressive, impactful decisions that you've made that really have had an impact on on the broader world. Do you have any... um, like words of wisdom or specific advice that you'd give to people my age and younger or older um, to sort of um, how they can make their own impact on on the world? Anything you've learned that you could pass on to us? No, I should put it as slightly different. Uh, about five years uh, ago, we, uh, in uh, 2000, was it? Uh, about five years ago, we had something called the global financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And people like uh, Queen Elizabeth was asked the economists in England, how come this occurred? And, I, and uh, Alan Greenspan, who was the former head of the Federal Reserve System, was asked by Congress, why was this global financial crisis occurring? And I have a quote in, I wrote a book uh, in response and I quote Greenspan as saying, well, he couldn't understand it. The, there was a, a, a huge intellectual model that had been built and the model had collapsed and he didn't understand why. And I wrote this book uh, to explain to the Queen of England and Alan Greenspan and anybody else who's interested why uh, suddenly oil had become such a strange problem and, and we were doing other things that were, uh, in my view, wrong. And the book, uh, the question was, what, what should I call the book? So I called it, Who's Afraid of John Maynard Keynes? Now, good title. Huh? It's a good title. Yeah, why? Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Was in, uh, and Virginia Woolf uh, and John Maynard Keynes happened to be uh, members of the same Bloomsbury group, social group, who engaged in all this strange social activities. So it was a good, it had a double meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book, which is about five years old now, Who's Afraid of John Maynard Keynes, explains people why we uh, had uh, this global financial crisis, what we should do about it, and uh, other things uh, uh, that we did which were wrong. For example, we. under the Truman administration and things like that, we had uh, 
we negotiated free market trades with China and Vietnam and things like that. And that's created a problem of unemployment in the United States. Why? We have a law in the United, a number of laws in the United States, starting with the Fair Labor Relations Act in 1938, which says in the United States, uh, we expect private enterprise to hire workers. Uh, and if they hire workers, they have to treat them fairly. And what do we mean by fairly? Well, the law stated, for example, that the standard work week should be 40 hours. Anybody working more than 40 hours should get overtime pains. Uh, also, that the facilities that they worked in have to be safe and that there has to be restrooms and a whole bunch of other things to treat workers fairly. Now, uh, and we do that. And we, we American employers uh, or domestic employers, I should say, are required to treat workers fairly. Well, that makes workers expensive, mm -hmm. you see. Whereas in, in China and in, uh, uh, in other words, before that, we called workers were working in sweatshop conditions. Uh, well, China and Vietnam and all these other minority uh, foreign countries, which now produce a lot of things that you buy at Walmart and so on. You don't, you go to Walmart and you can't find anything made in the USA. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they don't treat their workers fairly. They treat them under the same sweatshop conditions that we treated workers prior to 1940s. And so they, they have a competitive edge. We can't have a, a a factory that treats workers unfairly producing in the United States. Example, uh, two examples. One is we uh, the Fair Labor Relations Act says children under twelve, <coughs> excuse me, children under twelve years old can't be employed in a factory. In uh, <coughs> Vietnam and China, they are employed in factory, so obviously there's uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, well. What should we do about it? <clears throat> uh, the, and the answer is we should not allow uh, uh, factories that, uh, that produce or under sweatshop conditions to sell in the United States. And the example I give, suppose we had a factory in a foreign country that made, let's say, automobiles, but they use slave labor. Now, in the United States, slave labor is illegal. Mm -hmm. So uh, they could use slave labor and produce an automobile a lot cheaper, you, you, same labor time and so on and so forth, and produce it a lot cheaper than Ford can do uh, in uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Should we allow slave labor produ production to be imported into the United States? And I think most people would say no. Right. Okay. Well, what we have not slave labor necessarily, but uh, sweatshop condition workers, should they be employed? And the answer is no. So the, if you want to solve your uh, uh, unemployment problem, which has gotten worse because we have free markets, the answer is you should make sure that the factories overseas treat work, are required to treat workers the same as we require factories in the United States to treat workers. I haven't gotten that message through yet to anybody, but it's in the book. Uh, so, so your advice for for those of us are to read the book. <laughs> advice is to read the, not to read it, but at least to buy it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. Well, that is all of my questions. Um, I I'm curious to hear what your evening plans involve. What are you and Marilyn up to tonight? What are we up to tonight? Uh, not that much that I think of ever since the uh, virus pandemic, the, what we do for evening enjoyment is we walk into the living room and walk into the living room says, well, we're still living because we're in the living room. Uh, and that's I it. We, uh, we haven't gone uh, out very often. Uh, yeah. Any out is mainly to see a doctor. 
<laughs> so that uh, uh, social life is 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 practically zero. Yeah. Mountains, kids come and visit us, or somebody comes and visit us. But through, and the, part of the reason is, uh, I don't drive anymore. Mm-hmm. After all, I'm 91 years old, and Marilyn doesn't drive anymore. So there's uh, our ability to go out and socialize is difficult enough. But then with the virus thing, right, it becomes almost impossible for somebody like us, uh, some yeah. of us, to go out. That's a bummer. But you can do fun things at home, right? Well, maybe a little bit. But I have an eye problem. I have yeah. something called glaucoma, which is makes me legally blind, and that puts a I cannot read and I cannot write. So uh, uh, I'm trying to still do research, and I note that a lot of people have read my articles. A lot of professional economists have read my articles, and there's a couple of uh, internet things that tell, send, send me notices that my uh, there's been 30 articles published this month and said uh, which cite my research and so on. Wow. But, uh, but I, you know, and, and a few thousand articles like that have been published in the last year or two. That's uh, pretty cool. My research. Yeah. But the problem is I can't respond to these things because I can't read the articles. And even if I could read them, to, to respond to them would be difficult. For example, uh, we put in a, uh, Biden put in this uh, thing to, to uh, limit Russia's ability, uh, to, yeah, Russia's ability to engage in foreign trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so far it's been effective. But the answer is, if you read my book, is uh, when you engage in foreign trade, if if uh, uh, if uh, if we buy something from uh, country X, we're creating demand for workers in country X rather than demand for the same workers in our country. If you prevent Russia from trading, then the, a whole bunch of countries that they've been trading with may find that they find their employment. I mean, unemployment problem becomes greater. So are we creating, for example, uh, Russia trades with European nations and the Eurozone. Uh, Are we creating a problem not only for Russia selling its products, but buying products from foreigners and therefore creating an unemployment problem in in some countries in Europe? Mm -hmm. Well, there is some statistics, again, in my book, I, I explain why. There are some statistics which will allow me, if I could get to the statistics, but I can't even get to them because I can't read them anymore. Right. To say which countries in in Europe might suffer besides Russia uh, from this uh, uh, limitation on trade that, that we put in. Because Russia buys a lot of things from some countries, they can't buy them anymore. They create unemployment in those countries that they used to buy from and mm-hmm. get workers employed. So there is a lot of research I would love to do, but because of my eyesight, I, I can't do. That's challenging. But it sounds like there's a lot of good ideas floating around in there. So maybe we need to, to get you someone who can resort, research, or like maybe someone can be your eyes. You let's, can be the brain. They could be your eyes. Let's help so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for telling me these stories. It's been very fun. Um, And nice to see you as always. Bye now. Bye.